will lead and guide us unto all truth and also because we have a love for truth and so we know that we are on the cusp of something big here so abaya thank you for each and every presence that you have allowed to meet together in this platform and we're excited just as james and just as every i know sister yusana and zephaniah and brother Dwayne. We are in expectation in Yahusha's mighty name. Amen. 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 All right. All right. And just grab a little bit of. Mm -mm. So I would like to remind. Uh, I guess I, I I decided not to publish the other one. I think we'll we'll see what happens with this one. But anyway, we saw. Uh, um, from our last meet that uh, iniquity was first paraded by a satan. So today, um, I'm going to try to share some of my afterthoughts as to why, because we talked about the iniquity. We also talked about um, why, potentially why there is no mercy um, that these divine beings, they are ineligible for mercy or blood atonement. So I just have some afterthoughts about that. And um, I also want us to, you know, to, to really, before we meet mercy and truth, because we're going to get to meet who they are today, right? We want to be able to perceive or understand why um, it's so, it's important for us to understand the origin of iniquity. You know, you've heard of um, the art of war, right? Um, the art of war is to study the enemy, not so, it was, I guess in a sense, to, to see their points of weakness is where I'm coming from. So when we look at S.A. Tan and how he paraded iniquity to the entire angelic realm, why is it Isaiah 14 says that one day he's going to be brought down to the lowest pit? And it says, those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble? Right? So we, I want just a piece of that for us to table and discuss later on. But we looked at iniquity um, that was found in a Satan's heart. And we also took interest into Proverbs 16 because it says, by mercy and truth, iniquity is perched. So we have the given, so the given of that, we know that that's Yahusha, because he is the Malki Zadik priest, right? He is the, the, the our Malki Zadik, right? But the, what we know also is that Yahusha wants to impress upon us who we are because we are in him. So this is also applicable to us. So we're having this conversation because I want us to see, to bring this ideology down to a heart level. We can personalize it, relatable, right? So that's why we're going to go back to the beginning. We're going to look at the first Adam or Atom or Adam, the first blood, the first man. 
And honestly, by looking at their story, I'm just going to tell you where I'm going. And then all of this is going to tie up to the Nashama and the new song. I can, I can, I can promise you that. But the reason why I like to, um, for us to dissect the Genesis 2 and 3 story is because out of that story, we're going to see spirit, soul, body. For us to be able to discern the difference between spirit and soul is critical. If we want to operate in the supernatural, that's critical. We also want to understand what iniquity, transgression, and sin is. And then we're going to take it from a gut, heart, brain perspective. And then we're going to go and examine the three parts of our brain. Right? Because this is a mind war. This is the more I see it, the more I am convinced that for us to operate in the supernatural, we need to have be literally transformed by the renewing of our mind. And that transformation leads to our transfiguration. Okay, so um, also, I just want to report to you confirmation after confirmation that we are on the right track. I, I don't know if you've listened to Matthew Nolan's uh, message on Shabbat, but he mentioned three or four key words. I already can tell where he's going, and I'm praising Yah because this is exactly what sort of I had anticipated from him. I, I could sense that he was getting weary and tired from the revelation message, and I was, I was sensing that. And so when he came away and had a sabbatical and he started to talk about he talked about supernatural, the need to be in harmony. And he touched on tent and tabernacle. And then what else did he say? He talked about Stephen. And my last YouTube video, I don't know if you saw it, but I put up my very last example was Stephen. And Stephen's name means crowned. So we're dealing with the coronavirus here. And behind, encoded in that COVID-19 structure is the, the enemy's attempt to attack our breath, attack our identity, the covenant, COVID, COVID-19, right? So it's like the covenant, the ID, our identity, the breath, In they are going to try to put forth their agenda of destruction and slaughter. But here's the thing that we have to understand. I was sharing this with, with Dwayne earlier. We don't realize the power of our brain, the power of our mind. And so by us looking and paying attention to the narrative that they are painting, that they are um, inundating us with, we're actually helping them manifest their agenda because they need our attention. When we pay attention to something, energy flows that way. We have, and this is sort of where we're going to go, right? Sorry, I think someone was, hey, Jess, mwah, mwah. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. And also confirmation, because even Jessica sent me a question about the curse um, that happened, uh, the consequences and the curse happened after the fall. And I said to her, listen, before you even sent me that question, Yahuwah's already showed me something on the weekend. So. We're all, like, like James is saying, we are all, the more we put this on the table, we're, be patient and you're going to see connections being made, okay? So first off the bat, right off the bat, let us first define mercy and truth. Because if we're going to understand how iniquity is purged, let's have an understanding of mercy and truth. Now, uh, my the definition that Yahuwah really impressed in my heart in simplicity Mercy is an act of a supreme being descending to an inferior in kindness. Okay, so if you look at the Hebrew, chesed, mercy, or chesed, sorry if I don't know how to pronounce that properly, and then emet, mercy and truth, chesed and emet. And I looked at someone else's definition of it. I think it's in the Strong's in the commentary. And they have described the combination of the both as steadfast loyalty. So it has something to do with steadfastness, behaving ethically, and being faithful to Yahuwah's will. So I looked at the word loyal, and the definition of that is basically a strong feeling of support or allegiance. 
right? So we understand loyalty from a concept of relationships. And, you know, rarely, so usually it's in equal within family or within relationships and employment or society and stuff like that. But rarely do we see loyalty from an extreme power and wealth uh, position to be loyal to someone of the opposite. So what am I saying here? Proverbs 20, 28 says, mercy and truth preserve the king and his throne is upholden or strengthened by mercy. So we're seeing an attribute of the most high here, the incomprehensible Yah in all his greatness and vastness in his heavenly kingdom. And to think that his throne is upholden by mercy. So what we're trying to understand here, why is S.A. Tan's, what he did was so um, unauthorized. It was so bad that he, it's, and he's not eligible for mercy. Um, so one thing that S.A. Tan chose to rebel against is that. It is Yahuwah's mercy, merciful attribute, okay? Remember, when we study the text in Ezekiel 28, we see that S.A. Tan is patterned after a measurement of the Most High. And if you look at Yahuwah, who has no beginning and no end, he is perfect, complete, and yet he is full of mercy. So S.A. Tan was also made complete, and yet he wanted more? He, who is a created being, an inferior being to Yahuwah, desired to ascend to the most high's level. So S.A. Tan, he um, violated, he, he, the five I wills that he expressed in Isaiah 14 is a direct violation of the word of Yah. Of, and, and what do I mean by that? I say five I wills and I'm, I'm using the word of Yah based on Hebrews 4.12. Because when we look at Hebrews 4.12, it gives us uh, an insight that the word of Yah is actually five-dimensional, okay? So what do I mean by five dimensions? So you've heard of the term fifth, the movie Fifth Element, okay? But let's read it if you've got your scripture. Um, For the word of Yah is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Okay, and so when you look at the two-edged sword, remember where that first appears in the garden, right? When Adam and Eve, when they were kicked out, when they were ejected, what was happening was the two uh, cherubim was out there and there was a, a two a sword, right? And I envisioned that as a, as a separation, as a downgrade of the dimension, okay? That, that the Garden of Eden was on at one point. But anyway, let's move on with what the verse says. It says, piercing even to the division of soul, that's one, spirit, two, joints, three, four, marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So that's five dimensions. That is, um, that is, so, so the word of Yah, in 5D, in comparison to our ability to perceive this world. So Paul talks about that we have at least four dimensions that we can sort of comprehend. Paul says in Ephesians 3.18, may, may we be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, remember that, length, depth, and height. So we know based on quantum physics and all that science stuff is that we are able to perceive in a three dimension, right? But the fourth dimension is we're able to comprehend that, but indirectly, okay? So what I'm saying is in Hebrews 4.12, we are able to comprehend soul, right? Our own thoughts, emotions, desires, intellect. We have joints and marrow, right? That's our physical body in connection to the energy points, right? And then we also have a heart, right? So that's four. But SA10 
had access to five dimension when it comes to obeying in, in when it comes to the word of Yah. So for us, we are limited in our scope. We don't really understand spirit unless we receive it, we walk in it by faith, okay, which we'll touch on, okay? But by comparison, again, Satan was created complete. So it's like he started his journey and he's already arrived. And for us, it's different, right? So, so Satan walked in the fullness of the presence of the Most High. And he, he had that up to, he had comprehension of that five dimensions, right? Because he operates in the spirit realm. But we're stripped of that part of the dimension, the spirit. We're, we're, we're stripped of that um, after the fall, right? Um, so point being is, S.A. Tan was supposed to be a conduit of Yahuwah's magnificence in glory. He was supposed to be um, the, uh, he's supposed to represent the light and voice and sound frequency of the creator to the angelic realm because we see that he's walking up and down in the midst of the fiery stone, right? And remember, the king of Tyre, the word Tyre is also rock in Hebrew. So what Satan did as far as his choices and his actions to rebel revealed the thoughts and intents of his heart. And so what was in his heart? Even though he's supposed to be the closest to Yahuwah's throne, he was the anointed cherub, okay? What he did, he was supposed to echo and emanate the creator who is full of mercy. He was supposed to be steadfast and faithful to Yahuwah's will. But what did he do? He did the opposite, right? As Satan was supposed to do that, his will, Yahuwah's will for him was supposed to be, um, was affixed to him, to be a covering of the throne, right? So um, what I'm saying is, uh, Satan's rebellion, the reason why the angelic realm is not, uh, is not eligible for mercy is because what they did was a, a direct violation of the entire knowable dimension. And I know that there's up to 10 or 11 dimensions, but I'm talking about what um, what uh, Hebrews is talking about as far as the word of Yah and how powerful and living it is, right? Um, Yahuwah is not surprised by, by Satan's rebellion, okay? So he is not, and this is why I believe that when you look at the, the precious stones on the, the breastplate that he had, he had, um, the text talks about 10, but really I see it as nine on golden breastplate, okay? So just backtrack a little bit. I wanna show you now, um, I wanna show you, give me a second screen. All right, here we go. So just as a quick recap, we're talking about, um, let me see here. We were talking about the origin of iniquity. And then um, we looked at the, um, uh, sorry, look, the origin of the iniquity. And then we looked at, we, we our interest is perked because the scripture says that mercy and truth is going to purge iniquity. So we're gonna get introduced to mercy and truth in a bit, but I think it's important just to make sure we're all on the same page as to what, what was um, in a Satan's heart, right? So I just put this together just as a quick recap again, and I sort of already um, touched based on it earlier, but just in case I missed anything. So, and, and do this on your own study as well, eh? So if you look at here, um, I've compared the first Malki Zadik, Adam, and the anointed Cherub, Cherub, right, or Cherub. So if you look at the similarities between the two of them, it's striking, actually. So if you look at the word, the anointed Cherub in Ezekiel 28, and if you look at the, the, the root word of the anointed, it actually is Mashak, Mash. It's very close to Mashiach, and I, I, I'm pretty sure it probably is exactly the same. So, so 
at SA10 was a Mashiach. Think about that for a second. He was the Mashiach cherub, okay? And then um, we know that Adam is also anointed, okay? Um, in the text of Ezekiel 28, we're going to see that uh, SA10 is called the guardian of Eden. And we also see that, um, that uh, Adam was also commanded to beautify or keep, work, and guard the garden, okay? So the differences between the two. A Satan is given nine precious stones on gold, and I know this is, I don't know if I can't see if Raquel is on the line, but I know this is one thing that she was looking, wanting to in, uh, look into. But if you look at Genesis 2, you're going to see that Adam was given two precious stones on gold, or three stones. Okay, so Adam is made complete as well, but with access. His completion or his perfection is conditional, in a sense, on access. Um, a Satan was made complete in his purpose. So what about state of beings, the difference between them? A Satan was made immortal. And the first Malkizadik is made the state of being of Adam is undetermined. Um, and the Satan's purpose is affixed, and Adam's purpose is purpose driven. Okay, so Adam is um, the way when we study the account in Genesis 2 and 3, you're going to see that Yahuwah, um, the way he is preparing Adam in the purpose that you know, that he is looking to drive out of him is from a parenting approach. So um, that's the father-son relationship approach. You're going to see it. And Satan, on the other hand, he was created privileged, right? And so five I wills of Satan preconditioned iniquity. And then there's also the five preconditions that Adam is finding himself in to be ready for ambassadorship and what do i mean by five preconditions so i believe that adam is limited to the five senses right because all of us right now we are limited to the five senses that we're able to perceive a reality right and on the but at the same time yahweh is looking to activate more senses within us. And that's why I put down that we do have five senses, but do you know that we have seven additional senses that we need to activate to operate in the supernatural? And so in total, we have 12 senses that we need to understand, we need to learn, and we need to break down piece by piece how that's going to look. And this is why when we look at the story of the garden, it is key for us to understand what's happening there, right? And in contrast with the anointed cherub, he, what he did, the five eye wills that he did, was the, the spiritual significance of that is equivalent to Proverbs 6, where Yahuwah describes the six deadly sins. Seven is the, the abomination to him. So again, an, the anointed cherub, he is a destroyer, is a blasphemer. The first Malki Zadik, Adam, is mercy and truth. Okay? So, um, and, and while we're at that, I wanted to look at quickly here for us to take a look at Satan's covering. Okay? So this, these are the stones that's described in Ezekiel 28. So you can do, you can compare the precious stones in two ways. One is you can study the stones that were given to the, the tribe, the 12 tribes of Israel, right? And the other side of it is you can look ahead in Revelation 22 or 21 and look and see what the new Jerusalem is made of, like the foundation of it is made up of 12 stones as well, right? But just a quick glance at uh, what is it? Remember we said he, Lucifer has nine, but we know that there's 12 
um, stones that was assigned to the children of Israelites, to each of their names, right? And I believe a part of the reason why um, Lucifer or a Satan was only given nine is because there is still uh, an attribute of Yahuwah that he still needs to discover. Like he is perfect in his purpose, but there is still an attribute of Yahuwah that obviously he didn't get. And one of that is mercy, right? <laughs> The obvious one is mercy. I'm sure there's more. But if you look at the missing stones that he doesn't have, whether it was taken from him, whether he it was never given to him, I really don't know. I know some people believe that he, he started off with 12, and maybe that's true. But let's just focus on the missing ones, right? So um, I just pulled this up on the Internet. And, and the overcoming power, the royal, the yield to royal seed, and a servant the servanthood right so um and if you want a copy of this i can email this to you for, for you to study it further but that's the, the point of this and i know james has stuff to add to this but the point is um we're gonna get down to that when we get there the point of today is to really get introduced to mercy and truth right and i just also wanted to point out and this is really specifically for james and i know some of you we're already gone when we were having this conversation, but we talked briefly about the uh, the Hadron Collider. Like, is that what you call it? Someone help me, please. Um, the CERN? Yes, yeah, it's called uh, CERN. Right, um, okay. There's, um, there is something, I'm gonna put, um, uh, are we able to copy links on the chat? Absolutely, uh, I, I just, um, yeah, okay. go ahead. I just, I, I, for some reason, I can't access it after, even though I record it, but I will make sure to capture it uh, before the end of our meeting. Okay, yeah, so then, cool. Because I'm gonna, um, I'm actually gonna show you guys something or like put it up on the on the chat. So to get a really good amount of information on CERN, um, I will um, leave you guys with a documentary. Uh, there's a group, I'm sure some of you guys know them. Uh, it's known as the Watchmen Reports. And um, they they make some really good documentaries. Um, their their sixth documentary is actually all about CERN dimensional actions, uh, how the brain is a multi-dimensional communicator between Yahuwah um, and everything that is around you, basically. How it's, it's a spiritual antenna, but also how um, it also acts as a doorway for spirits. And CERN is like the, it is the mechanical representation of the quantum part of our brain, basically, right? But it takes what is intangible and makes it tangible because if it's, if it's you know, thoughts and so on, that's an intangible thing. But um, sometimes our thoughts are projections of something that is actually real. And um, it goes, it goes so, so far into it. And um, it's, it, I will let you know right now, <laughs> if you have apocalypse anxiety, just be aware that it is a lot. It is a lot. And um, there's also something that's known as the um, Illuminati card game. Um, mm -hmm. That is, it's literally a card game with their entire agenda on it. Mm -hmm. the, um, there's some cards on there that if you did not understand scripture or did not believe in scripture, you would look at some of these cards and be like, all right, now they're going a bit too far. This is foolishness and so on. Um, the mm -hmm. cards have the Pentagon, the Pentagon bombing on it, it has 9-11 on it, it has the Boston bombing on it, the uh, fall of the uh, nations, the... Um, how the uh, Federal Reserve is fake, Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, like all of this is on cards. And they all have descriptions, Flat Earth, um, uh, the, the space, uh, moon hoax, all of it, all of it, right? But when you get further down to some of the scarier cards, it starts to say like plague of demons or um, uh, like, internet data breach or like demons coming through computers and phones and things like that. And I'm over here and I'm over here like, 
okay, so if you're telling me that all this stuff that has already happened in this card game, and there's also these things called goal cards, right? So if you collect the goal cards, you win. There's multiple goals. There's um, massive, um, it's world of population, massive genocide, mm -hmm. um, total, uh, total control over all major businesses and monopolies, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there's a few other ones. But the whole thing about the Plague of Demons, um, there's actually quite a few cards on that. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, <laughs> it's um, quite, quite unsettling, but it's still, it's, it's truly, truly important information. And it gives you an idea of how serious these people are. Right. Like they are serious. Right. And I'm actually going to tie that back into the whole mercy and truth thing, too. Um, but, yeah. Is it like the purge, but instead of a movie, it's a card game? Oh, hold on. Sorry, hold on, hold on. Um, Raquel, can you say that again? It's a little... I said, is it like the purge, but a card game? Um, it's... Oh. You know what I'm talking about? You know that movie, The Purge? Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. So it's, it's, The Purge is one of the cards. Mm. So, because it, it literally has their entire agenda. Like, so, um, from what they wanted to start, what they were able to start, what is in effect, and what will eventually be in effect. Like, they even have a Messiah card. So we already know who that is. Wow. Yeah. So the, the the gold cards is what's most important because we're getting to those stages. Like mass genocide will be soon, unfortunately. Um, the businesses are starting to merge into one. Amazon is taking over. And I want um have you guys noticed that the Amazon symbol is actually a phallic symbol, you know? Um, like I'm pretty sure that they're they're trying to um that they they they're rocking Nimrod on that uh, on that logo, but um, anyway, they um phallic symbol. What is that? Uh, phallic symbol basically means um, representative of the male re reproductive organ. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So, so, so uh, James, you are speaking the language that's in my spirit. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So. The, as complicated seemingly like you were saying that this goes really deep right what you're um, you know the study of getting down into this what I'm hoping to do in our iterations is take all of that stuff and simplify it in the story of guard the, in the garden story because um, the process is no different so what I mean and I was the, the way the process to empower, the process to activate and have their agenda be able to come forth, it's, it's the same process. The only difference is who is the authority under the process and who are you loyal to? Who are you giving your attention to, right? So what I mean by that is this, right? Um, and this is a a recent, uh, like actually just this morning revelation. Um, you know, we quote Ephesians where it says, you know, the prince of the power of the air, right? And we right away, and this is me, I don't know about you, but for me, I thought that the power was attached to the prince, okay? It's actually not. you got to read it carefully. It says the prince of the power of the air. So the power is in the air, not the prince, okay? So let's take it back to the beginning. Yahuwah breathed the breath of life into the nostrils of Adam. So the creator of air is Yahuwah, right? And because he breathed that into Adam, he, what he's saying is, I want you to have rulership over the earth, right? And so when you read Ephesians, the prince is the ruler 
of the power of the air. So in other words, we have been hijacked of our authority, of our power. And this is why what we're touching on this, I know that the, this is something that the enemy doesn't want us to know. So long as we are asleep to who we are, so long as all the enemy needs to do is, is hide, is, is direct our attention and put our attention to him, to the enemy instead. And little do we know that in order for them to, um, you know, manifest what their agenda is, they actually need us. They actually need our, our breath our, the, for us to surrender the authority we have on earth, right? So what I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I'd love for us to see that in the, because I said it earlier, I think some of you missed it. When we, when we study the Garden of Eden, Adam, Eve, the flesh, uh, sorry, the serpent, you have to see it from a perspective of spirit, soul, body, and then we're going to take it even deeper and bring it down to our brain. Because our brain is also a triune, there's triune parts of our brain, and you'll see that Adam is so, uh, Eve and serpent is also in the brain. You're going to see that. So that's sort of where we're going to go. But now I want to just go through the mercy and truth, right? Um, but just quick thing, because um, I know this is Raquel wanted to see this. In the garden story, you're going to see in Genesis, was it 2.15, that there's three stones there, right? And so what I'm saying is um, Adam was made with just these stones access to him, given to him. And then we know that in Revelation, we know that the bride, which is the new Jerusalem, has the full 12. But I just wanted to highlight that, you know, he starts off with gold, and you look at the color, black and uh, 12. You're bringing 12, the, the, the verse, the and verse. And I want you to, right, I want you to notice the heart because that, we're going to get there. We're going to dissect the verse, and you're going to see that the heart and the tent or the tent of Adam is actually a picture of brain and heart coherence. So when Adam was put in the garden, Yahuwah's perfect will for him was to have his brain, his mind, and his heart be in one. So that's why you see the river flowing from Eden, from Adam, right, to the garden and watering, splitting into four channels. So if you look at the heart, you see Shin, and you look at the heart has four chambers. And this is the rocks or the precious stones that is um, in Revelation 21, okay? And just as a quick, um, I guess, just as a quick sort of nugget, the ones that Satan don't have here are chrysolite, chrysoprasus, chalcedony, and there's a couple more. But this, these three, is so interesting because that those three stones, if you study the root word, you will find that it actually is in the name of Mashiach, like in 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 Christ, in the word Christos or Christ. Okay, so um, let me just go back to my notes. I just want to make sure. So um, there's no mercy. For rebellious angelic beings because their worship leader failed to bring about mercy in, another, in other words right but what about those that did not rebel who hasn't rebelled or has not rebelled right so there's the angelic one third of them that you know follow pursuit with a satan um what about those that didn't rebel so we know that Satan paraded iniquity, right, to the entire angelic being. But now this is where the Melchizedek, Melchizedek priesthood comes to play. Because I see this position of authority, this, um, this set-apart priesthood, as Yahuwah's way of parading in his, his, the power of mercy and truth, not only to the families on earth, 
but also to the angelic realm, right? So, and that's why if you look at um, this number eight, okay, and where it converges. So if you look at the, um, the, the top part, I see that as the heaven, the heavens, and then the bottom is the earth, right? The Malkizadi priesthood is in between. It's where it converges, right? It, where it meets. Because we ha there, is an, there is an audience from above and, and from on earth that, is, that Yahuwah is teaching a lesson of, right? And so, and we know, Paul talks about that we are being made a spectacle to the world both to angels and to man. That is 1 Corinthians 4, 9, right? So, so we know that there, is, there are lessons to be learned, not just from where we're at, but also from above. So the angels are also looking at us intently to see the unfolding of attributes of Yahuwah that they haven't really fully comprehended yet, right? So when you look at, you know, things like for, uh, 1 Corinthians 11.10, for this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels, right? And things like, oh, don't forget to entertain strangers, right? Or don't, don't forget to have a love for guests, for by doing so, you've entertained angels. So you see that, and this is... What I'm trying to say is trying to set up the stage of the Garden of Eden is what I'm trying to say to you. The Garden of Eden is not just like I was sharing with the ladies. It's not just in the backyard somewhere. The Garden of Eden is on a mountain. It is on higher ground. OK, so. Um, and uh, OK, so let us. Pause for a second, and I think we are ready to meet up with mercy and truth. Okay, and before I do that, because I really want to get us to comprehend that this is a mind, a mentality war. Okay, if I were to say, in the beginning was thought, if I said that, does that sound foreign to you? And feel free to answer. Or if I say, in the beginning was thought. I feel like that's close to what is said, but in the beginning there was the word. So it wasn't just a thought. It was a more established, concrete, like, command almost. Mm, right, right. So it, it, that, that's, exactly, that's exactly what I was expecting. Um, so when we go back to, Je to John 1, right, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with Yah, and the word was Yah, right? So right now I am speaking. You can hear me express words to you by sound, right? And also we can express words written. But what's interesting is without our bodies, without our flesh, how are we going to comprehend words without sound, being able to hear and being able to see? Right. So point what I'm trying to say is the word word, if you break it down into the Greek. Right. If you look behind and this is just Greek, this hasn't even this isn't even Hebrew yet. So this is I mean, you know, Hebraic. Yeah, this is just the first couple layers. It, the word means logos. It's a word uttered by a living voice but it also is an embodiment of a conception or idea. And if you look further down, logos come from the word lego. So if you look at lego pieces, right? And if you look at how for you to be able to build, uh, you know, a, a structure, it would have to start off with little structures, little pieces of legos, right? Point is, in the beginning was word, and then we eventually, in verse, um, a couple of verses later, it says, this word became flesh, right? So word, and we know the word is Yahusha, right? But really, the word 
is from a collection of or a conceived but it's from the thoughts of Yahuwah right so Yahusha is Yahuwah's thoughts if you think about it his thoughts come to dwell and tabernacle among us right so why am I highlighting that why am I highlighting that because in him John 1 4 says in him was life so in the word is life so in and the life was the light of man right so if you look at yourself as you know as Jessica as James as, as your entire being right now we know that you are you started off as a zygote we all started off as one single cell right and then we ended up dividing multiplicate like we increased so we are made up of trillions of cells right and so now when you look at first John 4 by this you know the spirit of Yah so so James mentioned something about being able to tangibly understand spiritual things um, and we talked about how the word of Yah has five dimensions, right? We can comprehend soul, right? Because that's tangible. We can feel. We know what we understand. And, you know, when we um, study and what we desire, joints, marrows, even our heart, in thoughts and intents, right? But how do you comprehend spirit? Spirit is actually just energy. It's thoughts. So for us to understand that thoughts is something that we can tangibly comprehend by thinking. So spirit, so if you look at a spirit of, you know, a spirit of fear, a spirit of fear is really a collection of related thoughts or energy that was nurtured, that was entertained, that, that started off as a seed somewhere, and then as, 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 as it is being nurtured, it becomes an entity, a spirit of fear, right? So I guess what I'm saying is for us to, to comprehend spirit, we want to learn how to walk in the spirit, then we got to grab our mentality. We got to be good stewards of our thoughts, right? So every spirit that confesses that Yahushua HaMashiach has come in the flesh is of Yah. And every spirit that doesn't confess that Yahushua HaMashiach has come in the flesh is not of Yah. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, right? And look at this. You are of Yah. You are of Yahuwah, little children, and have overcome them. Because he, and that's 1 John 4, 4, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the, in the world. So the word of Yah, Yahuwah's thoughts, came in the flesh and dwelt among us. So Yahusha, who is in us, is greater than he who is in the world. So you know, do you see why the very first target of the enemy is for us to have very poor stewardship of our thought life, okay? And, and this is why there is a call for Paul to say that, May your entire being be sanctified. You know, may your spirit, soul, body be preserved and be blameless unto the coming of our master, Yahusha. And, and this is just an example of, of um, what I mean by Yahusha, by the word coming in the flesh. So if, you, if we study our biology, you're going to see that we even have this laminin protein. And if you look at it, it looks like a top. A cross, a top. Am I saying that tau? Right? And and that this little protein is what keeps upholds everything. It's what keeps us together. It's critical for our cells to live this little protein that's in our um in our bodies, right? So I know I've said a lot to so get yeah. to the place. <laughs> yes. So yeah. Yes. Go go back to the picture of lanolin, lanolin whatever you call it. Yes. <laughs> lanolin. Lanolin. Okay, so I'm always 
from it taught that it's the cross and that's what holds us, holds us together and whatever. But I'm looking at it and I'm looking at it in... It's like a little man, right? No, I'm looking at it through the perspective of Genesis 2. It's the four rivers. Mm. Apart. Hmm. Nice. What what verse is it? What four rivers. She's talking four about rivers oh, from, the from four rivers. Four rivers. Ah, <laughs> that's right. You and see how many the four rivers, rivers or all the four rivers come come together in the garden. Back yes. to the place that is. Um, awesome. That's cool. Where you, where you fellowship with with Yahuwah. That's, that's yes. the place where you're in the midst of the garden and you're able to be one with him. Yes. It all that's, converges. Yes. That's that's what I'm saying. Yes, yes. And and there trust me, there are layers and layers. What is so important? See, when you start seeing things like that, then that means there is um an unfolding of light the unfolding of light is starting to happen to give understanding to the eyes of our hearts so what you're starting to see what yahuwah is starting to awakening within our hearts and this is sort of my desire is for for us to see that we are so much more than what the sa 10 and his minions have worked for thousands and thousands of years to hide from us we got to see it like that. So, and this is why when we look at the story in the garden, right? So, so think of yourself, think of the um, kindergartens or, you know, when you go to school and you go, you know, um, grade twos and kindergartens and junior JKs and SKs, sorry. What you're going to notice is that in their environment of learning is there's a lot of pictures, right? Pictures and colorful and you know, and that's attractive to a child's mind, right? And that really helps teach children uh, concepts and ideas. So when we look at the garden story, right, we have to enter into it like a child's mind. Like, you know, the, unless you become like a child, you will not enter into the kingdom, right? Yahushua says that, right? And so... The problem with the garden story is that it is too familiar, right? Because we all know that in Sunday school, it's been reduced to, uh, you know, coloring books and all these things, right? <laughs> and it's sort of, that's it. So the problem with the garden story is that it is too familiar, seemingly. Um, we think we've seen it all. And it's too few of a verses because it's only really, what, 25 verses when it comes to Adam and Eve prior to the fall, right? Um, and then it's too foreign for us. It just seems, I don't know, to, to me, that's the problem. But we have to understand that what happened in the garden is what shifted in the entire mankind. It, it severed the earth into a lower dimension. So what I'm saying is it's key to understand what's happening in there. So how do you unpack a few verses? How do you, you know, for us to glean from it, from a few verses to gain understanding on, on what the message of it all is? Really, it is in layers. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at it from layers, from a layered perspective. We're going to look at behind uh, you know, underneath the words, and we're going to compare scripture to scripture and take the whole counsel of Yah. And you're going to notice I will not refer to any extra biblical sources, just using what's in the story. Okay, so the garden or, okay, let me now go, give me a second. So um, the garden of Adan and I'm using the word Adan because that is the most accurate. As you probably heard James say, there's really no E in the Hebrew language. So it is Adan or instead of Eden. Look at how close that is to the word Adam. So Adam, 
Garden of Adan, right? And we know that Adam was made in the image and the likeness of the Most High. So already you can see very close to the name, the Adan, the Adan, Garden of Adan, right? Also, the ground in which Adam was planted in was is, is called Adama. Okay, so the Garden of Adan, we can understand from a macro perspective what mercy and truth is in looking at the garden and then looking at adam himself or atom atom and we're going to also touch base why am i using the word adam adam is a building block of um of um okay it's leaving me so cells are broken down into uh particles and then atoms and then subatomic particles right so um so from that perspective, we're going to see Adam from a micro perspective and also representing mercy and truth. So if you look at Psalms 89, 14, justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. It's talking about Yahuwah, right? Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. So when you look at in the creation of Adam, he had a face to face, panim to panim encounter with Yahuwah, right? Adan, D is adore, N is life. Wow, nice connection there, um, Sister Yasana. Wow. And so already we can tie, you, you know, I'm trying to reveal bits and pieces just by looking at the combination of mercy and truth. You can already see, um, you know, pieces of, of the garden story. Um, how about this? Psalm 85:10. mercy and truth are met together. So in Hebrew, that's pagash, to join, to encounter. So mercy and truth has to encounter one another. And righteousness or zadik, zadik, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. So now in, in the Hebrew word kiss, that's nashak, to put together, to be equipped, to be kindled to make a fire, wow, to be a light to the world, hmm, right? And so mercy and truth meets in the garden, okay? The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you.